The efficiency of our military is dependent on training, and our training is dependent on the locations where we train. Wherever we are in the world, we need safe, sustainable training spaces to deliver operational readiness and effectiveness. Our training areas are a resource, and like any resource, you need to manage it so it's sustainable and that uh, we develop it for future use. So if we damage uh, the environment that we want to train in, not only do we damage it for future users, uh, we also need to maintain a reputation as, as an army of being good at looking after the, the training estate that we have uh, to enable us to have the consent to, to conduct the training that we want to be able to conduct. To ensure our training spaces are available 24-7, 365, now and in the years to come, we need to work together and respect the communities that we share the land with. We need to work with the public to help them understand and observe access restrictions. Training areas can be both beautiful and dangerous places, so both the military and the general public have a duty to ensure that access to training area land is managed safely and sustainably. Not only does this require careful planning and management, but also cultural and environmental awareness. If we don't get this balance right, we'll end up with less effective areas to train and military capability will be compromised. This video is split into four sections. Firstly, we'll look at how we can work together to protect local culture and heritage. Secondly, we'll see how we can keep our environmental impact to an absolute minimum. Thirdly, we'll cover safety, yours and others. And finally, we'll look at the policies and practices we use to achieve all this. By the end of the video, you will understand your role in protecting our training areas and making sure we can continue to have the access that is so crucial for maintaining operational readiness. I'm Richard Osgood. I'm the senior archaeologist that works for the Defence Infrastructure Organisation, part of the Ministry of Defence. I'm one of three archaeologists that's employed by MOD and it may seem strange that the MOD has archaeologists working for them, but the reason being is that we are custodians of such an important heritage estate. We have 10 World Heritage Sites on our areas, we have hundreds and hundreds of scheduled monuments listed buildings, and we've got sites across the world on which we train that are important to those communities and of course to the wider world. As such, what we really need to do is to protect them in our training activities to make sure that our presence leaves as a little trace as possible in the activities of defence. Wherever the training area, whatever the country, we work in partnership with local communities. We respect that every community is different and has different needs, and we value the collaborative relationship we build with them. We must always remember that we are their guests, and by developing local cultural understanding, we can ensure a good working relationship that benefits us all. So what do we mean by cultural understanding? Well, we mean things like only using our allocated areas, being aware of local farmers and who owns the land, respecting archaeological areas such as monuments or burial mounds, and respecting places of religious importance. We also need to remember that the general public may have access to the area and be vigilant to any unauthorised use, whether innocent or otherwise. Sharing training space can be a delicate matter, so do make sure you get to know the range staff. For example, the training safety officers and the training area operatives. These are the people with local knowledge based on experience. What's up? What's up, Major? What's up? TSM for the area. Do you want to make sure you've got your, your DRSs for the week? Yep, just in that lower right. Not only are they a great information resource to you, they can also save a lot of unnecessary grief. We're standing on an Iron Age hill fort. Dates from about 300 BC, so 2,300 years ago, people were digging huge monuments of this scale. We are custodians of such an important part of real estate, both in this country and overseas. We have many World Heritage Sites, scheduled monuments and listed buildings. And the whole idea of defence is to look after culture and way of life. Um, as such, 
The British military presence is, is, is an important protector for heritage of the world. So, in summary for culture and heritage, everywhere we train impacts on a local community. We are effectively their guests. Treat the locals respectfully. Liaise with the experts to maximize the benefits of your training. The responsibility for environmental protection initially li lies with the training unit. One thing you must understand is that in each of the countries, the statutory regulator is looking at what we're doing. There, there are obligations placed upon us. Those constraints are cascaded into the range standing orders. In addition to that, there, are, there is legislation that we must abide by. And so whatever we need to do in order to comply with that legislation, those measures are inserted into the range standing orders. So as a training unit, the range standing orders, the map are absolutely essential because that means then that we can comply with the law of that country, with the license agreements with that landowner and uh, we can manage our, our use of that land as a responsible land user. Looking after the training environment means a lot more than just clearing up after ourselves and recycling, though we need to do that too. It also means respecting and protecting any environmentally sensitive or designated areas, so check your exercise plans with the range staffs. Just because it's not protected where you live, doesn't mean it won't be somewhere else. If we harm protected species or habitats, the military can be prosecuted, which means less money available for other essential things, such as equipment and accommodation. There are also particular aspects of our training that can have a negative impact on the environment if we're not vigilant. For example, vehicular activity. Remember to stay on the tracks and avoid any restricted areas, both those marked on maps and signposted on the ground. Consider if the landscape can take the training operation you're planning, especially in poor weather conditions. And remember, fires can spread rapidly and wreck a training operation, so always keep your eyes on them and put them out quickly. And before you start any digging, check what's permitted with the range staff and ensure the ground is fully restored afterwards. Pollution is a real hazard to the environment. Remember that all training areas have the potential to affect rivers, which are a water supply for the local community as well as ourselves. Manage all liquid wastes appropriately, such as cooking fats, grey water, and vehicle fuels and lubricants. Be aware of emergency response procedures and ensure that you know where spill kits are kept and how to use them. The bottom line is that we have to leave that training ground without a trace, exactly as we found it except for our footprints. So clear up properly. Don't leave used ammunition, pyrotechnics, ration packs or packaging lying around. Use clear plastic bags for rubbish disposal and separate out used brass, canisters and packaging for recycling. And please, use the toilet facilities that are provided. Actually, we can do a lot more than just limit the negative effects of our training on the environment. Since we started using Salisbury Plain training area in the late 19th century, the military has had a positive impact. We've helped reduce damaging development and protect many at-risk species and habitats. So, in summary for the environment, Consider the impact of your actions. Only do what is permitted. Protect surface water and groundwater and clean up waste properly. Good behaviour on the training area enables our continued use. Preparation is absolutely key before we conduct any training. There's absolutely no point in turning up and then doing a risk assessment on the day. So preparation, leadership and professionalism are absolutely key 
and it's a responsibility for everyone who's deploying to make sure they understand the risks that they're going to face when conducting training on a training area. You know what we say, train hard but train safe. No training exercise can ever justify putting anyone's life at risk. As well as watching out for changeable climatic conditions and being aware of heat and cold injuries, different training environments have different safety challenges which you'll be briefed about. For example, livestock, wildlife and predatory animals, toxic and dangerous plants, disease-carrying insects and ticks. Make sure you take the necessary precautions and have access to first aid. When you're on the roads, be aware of other road users. Comply with local speed limits and convoy procedures and use proper vehicle crossing procedures as directed by range staff. Don't take risks on unknown terrain. Keep the noise down whenever you can and be aware of dust, vehicle emissions and vibration. And remember, there will be different safety needs at night than during the day. Finally, ammunition and pyrotechnics. Clean up after your operation and remove any military debris such as unexpended ammunition including dealing with blinds, wire and defences. Remember that any unused ammunition needs to be accounted for so take it back to the unit and follow procedures. There should be no ammunition in bins. Report any fines and don't allow anything to access the public waste stream or environment. These safety measures are for you and for the public. RCO, this is Sentry. Please be aware you've got a civilian moving down to your location. Over. If you do see anything or anyone in the training area that shouldn't be there, make sure you report it immediately. Don't assume someone else has already done it. So, to summarise safety issues. Properly prepare for climatic and environmental conditions. Don't take risks with vehicles. Follow correct ammo procedures. Report anything that doesn't seem right. Much of the material that we use in training presents an obvious danger not only to military personnel but also to civilians once we've left the training area. That can be either ordnance, ammunition, but could also be wires, poles, posts and holes that we put into the ground. The risk of harm is very clear, but also a reputational risk to the Army for being an ill-disciplined and unprofessional force. It's a matter of professionalism to make sure that we clear the area of everything that we've used and clear it of hazards so that the local population, and particularly children, aren't injured as a result of our unprofessionalism on the training area. All training areas worldwide conform with MOD training policies. If there's any deviation, that's expressed in local range orders and that's why it's vitally important to talk to the local range administering unit. The unit will recce and plan its training activities and the range administering unit will allocate the training area, taking into consideration the environmental factors and other users. We have well-established policies and practices in place. Each stage of your training operation has been thought through and planned long before you turn up at your location. Firstly, senior personnel will have done a recce. The recce will highlight any cultural, environmental and safety issues at your site. With that information to hand, a plan will have been drawn up at headquarters level. Next, key personnel on your training op will then have been briefed and risk assessments and emergency response procedures will have been drawn up and communicated to you as part of a safe system of training. After your training operation, there is a detailed plan for the post-op clear-up to ensure we leave without a trace. And finally, there's a review to ensure the plan has been implemented effectively and training objectives have been met. 
To ensure your training runs smoothly, each defence training area has their own HQ staff and managers with key local knowledge. Talk to them to make sure you get the best from your training. Your commanders will also have been given range standing orders, which set out specific details to be complied with. Make sure you understand these. There are also daily range summaries which must be understood and followed, and each training area has an emergency aid memoir, which must be carried at all times. If you have any concerns or questions about anything on your training, talk to your commanders. They will have all the information you need on the policies and practices for your training location. They'll also be the people who will notify you of the procedure to follow should you find something of interest. So, remember, good planning and risk assessment is a fundamental part of training. Plan in time for post-exercise clear-up and review. Follow the training area's practices and procedures at all times. Speak up if you have concerns or questions. Like I said at the start, our military capability is dependent on training and our training is dependent upon having good locations to train in. We work in partnership with the communities that share those locations. And as long as we respect their cultural traditions and their environment, and we keep the space safe for ourselves and everyone else that uses it, then we can continue to use those locations for years to come. In the end, it comes down to these key points. The military is dependent upon good training areas. This requires a partnership with the local community and cultural respect. Minimize your impact on the environment. Act responsibly, safely, and in accordance with procedures. Think and act with the future in mind. Without a trace.